in the park last Friday night. Not the Auckland Super City Christmas in the park, but the local Walkworth mini version, sponsored by the Rotary Club, not Coca-Cola, where the nearest thing we had to a celebrity artist was Lockwood Smith. And there, in the midst of hundreds of school kids, in Santa hats, waving glow sticks in the dark, and singing synthesized Christmas songs to pre-recorded soundtracks that kept stopping in the wrong places, I realized that the Christian community has long ago lost control of Christmas and let alone has much of a chance to influence it anymore. We can enjoy it, of course. It still is a good thing to do. It promotes family feelings and generosity and present giving and charitable thoughts and actions too. And in snatches of song, you can still glimpse the spiritual passion that once drove this festival. In the voices of the children, you can sometimes still hear the angels singing until the drum machine drowns them out again. But the one occasion in the secular year that used to give a nod of recognition to our Christian heritage is pretty much sold out to commercialism and sentimentality. Now, I'm a keen customer of commercialism and Hollywood movies, so I'm in no position to complain about this. But I do need to be clear about what Christmas isn't anymore and where I might look for alternatives. Alternatives to discovering the world beyond us and around us that is filled with mystery and wonder and beauty and transcendence that can lift us out of ourselves and transform us. Christmas always did that for me once upon a time and it may still do that for children and it may still do that for you and if so, enjoy it. I'm currently reading Ken Follett's novels about the medieval world of cathedral builders and knights in armor. And while I could do without the rape and the pillage, the violence and the superstition, I envy just a little bit that sense of enchantment that surrounded the lives of our forebears back then. Back then, the angels were very close and they outnumbered the demons most of the time. The best use we can make of this Advent season is to try and reconnect with a sense of wonder about the magic of the world around us. Not the instant manufactured magic of tinsel stars and synthesized music, but the magic that comes from knowing that we are part of a creation that is crammed full of complexity and creative energy, that we're part of a human community that is resilient and adaptable and with a potential that we can barely imagine. And knowing that deep within ourselves there is a connection with all other living things, a connection that is filled and fueled, to use the language of the prayer book, by the presence of the great compassion, the love that will not let us go, the God who never gives up on us. That sense of wonder about the magic of the world around us 
will meet us if we are open to being met in all sorts of ways through the fascination of science and technology, through the inspiration of art and music, through examples of human courage and sacrifice and service that go way beyond any usual obligation, and through the struggles for justice that go on against all the odds. That sense of wonder, it still meets us even in the most ordinary, everyday moment. And if we're lucky, it can still transport us. You don't have to wait for super special events for that to happen. It can even happen when you're doing the washing. As the American poet Richard Wilbur once put it, Outside the open window, the morning air is all awash with angels. Oh, let there be nothing on earth but laundry, nothing but rosy hands in the rising steam, and clear dances done in the sight of heaven. However it comes to us, and it does come to us. We don't invent it or create it or make it happen. Like the God of whom we say, you come to us before we come to you. However it happens, this sense of wonder raises our hopes and expectations about the world around us and even about ourselves. When you walk away from hearing a great concert or watching a great movie, or seeing the sun set over the sea, or renewing a lost friendship, or seeing someone act with courage and grace that you could never manage, then the world does become a more hopeful place for a while, whatever's happening in the Eurozone, or whatever's happening to the GDP. Advent is the season for rediscovering the sense of wonder, for retuning our ears to the song of angels. And when we're able to begin to do that, then and only then, the story of Mary starts to come alive. Because this is a story of a young woman who was supremely well qualified to hear the voice of angels. She has become the template, the gold standard for Christians in the art of hearing angels sing. Mary didn't have to work as hard at it as we do to find this world of great expectations. She lived in a God-intoxicated culture that lasted up until at least the end of the medieval era in the West, where the sacred pressed in on the secular on every side, where no one denied the reality of the spiritual world because it terrified them all the time. But it's not her religious sensitivity. It's not her spiritual awareness that we celebrate in the story. She was surrounded by people who heard the voice of God all the time. What makes Mary so special and such a powerful role model for us is the way she responded. Somehow, once she recovered from the terror of having an angel call on you and tell you you're pregnant, Mary claims the right to ask questions about it. Mary takes charge of herself and uses her intellect and her common sense to argue and ask for an explanation. She fronts up to the angel and she says, how can this be? She uses her reason 
one of the three touchstones of our Anglican tradition, along with scripture and tradition. We're meant to be the people who claim the right to make sense of things and ask questions. When you're trying to find your way through the world of spiritual discovery, you need to do that. You need to keep your wits about you because there are frauds and false promises on every side. Just watch the ads around you this week that promise you can spend your way to happiness this season, that you can buy the security that your children need, that you can repair relationships with a credit card. Mary wants to understand how can this be? And we aren't told exactly how she gets the answers that she needs, though we know that some of them come from talking to her family, seeing the, ex the example of a cousin called Elizabeth, connecting, as it were, with her whakapapa, trusting the wisdom of her heritage. We don't know exactly how Mary gets the assurance that she needs, but she does find it by asking and pondering. And a little while later in Luke's story, we're told that Mary treasured the things that were happening to her and pondered over them. That has to be one of the most understated sentences in the Bible. Just imagine the tumult this teenage girl was undergoing. But question and ponder she does. And then the next action in this legacy that she leaves us, this model of listening and responding to God, is to say, all right, here I am, let it be. There aren't many pop songs that drop us into the heart of mystery, but John Lennon and Paul McCartney came pretty close when they wrote, when I find myself in times of trouble, Mother Mary comes to me, speaking words of wisdom, let it be. And in my hour of darkness, she is standing right in front of me, speaking words of wisdom, let it be, let it be. Whisper words of wisdom, let it be. What Mary does for us in this story is to show us how to surrender to a God who will meet us in moments of wonder. The story is asking us to first of all tune ourselves into this world of wonder and mystery that surrounds us all around us, just beyond us, always out of our control. To listen, to wait, to dare to expect something to happen. And when it does, as it will, to question and to ponder and then, and then to respond, not, not half-heartedly, not cautiously, not with a bob each way, but to surrender ourselves, to give ourselves over completely to whatever it is God is asking us to do. Here I am, let it be. And the beauty of this story is that it could happen to any one of us without leaving home. No special qualification, no training, no experience is required. You could not find anyone less prepared than this young teenager for the call that God was making on her life. It is the utter ordinariness of her circumstances the absolute practicality of her question, how can this be, 
that makes the story so powerful and so accessible to so many, especially if you are young and vulnerable and poor and wounded and ripped by the violence of life. When you're trying to be open to God, use the resources that God gives you. Trust the instinct to find what is useful and practical. This matter-of-fact teenager did that as she faced up to the angel, terrified and overawed though she was. Last month in Auckland, Dorothy Brown died, and we lost a great Anglican advocate of peace and justice. This woman whose vision helped to drive the creation of the first chair of peace and conflict studies at Otago University. A woman of great faith. Her motto was always to bring a set of questions to any issue or cause that came her way. And she would ask, is it true? Is it kind? Is it necessary? It's that same sort of down-to-earth wisdom that Mary models for us. Listen, engage with your questions, ponder, and then surrender. In this Advent time, on the eve of the Christ child coming, are you ready and open to be surprised by his coming? Are you ready to be able to say, if you're asked, wherever, however that might happen, through whoever God might be using to ask you, are you ready to say, here I am, let it be. In Jesus' name we dare to say these things. Amen.